going back to the previous point about who are the best resources for that information, I really lean on uh, my nursing colleagues and their pharmacy colleagues because the pace of um, oncology now is such that I don't think that physicians can keep up. And so having the, the team-based approach is really the way to go and making sure that these patients know who to talk to. Yeah. One of the things I always tell patients is there are no points for bravery. You know, yeah. this isn't a situation where, you know, don't feel like you're burdening the physician with information. You know, I was sick. And like you said, it's, it should not be expected side effect. So I always tell them, you know, like you have a hint of nausea, nip it in the bud. It's probably preferable that you're a little drowsy for a, a short period of time than, you know, starting that really terrible cycle of nausea, potential vomiting, and then getting into a dehydration situation and it just perpetuates itself. As a pharmacist, do you talk to the patients directly at your institution or is that a nursing function or how does it work? It's uh, both. Um, so I don't get to see every single patient. Um, I don't get to counsel every patient about their therapies, but they'll often bring me in on a complicated patient. Um, of course, we're having that conversation in the clinic, but then um, we go in and get to talk to the patients. Most of it's nursing education, but they'll sometimes bring me in when they feel like it's a little complicated or you know, particularly for the delayed nausea portion, um, it seems like that's one area where people are still not understanding and getting it right. You know, our practice uses nurse navigation. So up front, we're already talking to these patients. And if the nurse navigator asks, we come in and talk to the patient about certain medications, including anti-emetic use. Um, we, we tend to find that physicians may set up the patient not to report. Mm. You say to the patient, you know, it's really important that you get all of this therapy because if I give you at least 90% of this dose, and it goes according to regimen, you'll have the best response. So the patient gets a problem and goes to see the next cycle, sees the physician, how'd you do? They don't want to say they did badly. Uh-oh, he's going to delay my treatment, he's going to reduce my dose. So we have to get him over that. And typically it comes back to, in the treatment area, all of a sudden, the question is answered differently. How'd you do last week? Not scared of telling the nurse, not scared of telling the pharmacist, because they'll help me but I don't want to tell a physician. So we try and educate also. You can tell everybody. We're all here in the same package to help you. But to get over that initial you know, fear to report for side effects is a problem. I think it's really important. So we still have, um, I think the multidisciplinary team is great. And in larger practices, as you're all saying, by having everyone, that's mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful way to minimize this toxicity. In smaller practices, which there are still smaller practices in uh, the United States where there's one, three, five man groups mm -hmm. that may not have an experienced pharmacist, and may usually have now uh, an advanced practitioner, but not all. So we still have a little bit of education to do for the physicians and to make sure what I'm hearing from you is very interesting because really we shouldn't as oncologists be telling our patients not to tell everything. Mm -hmm. It should be the exact opposite. Right. Tell us everything. We have ways to deal with exactly. this and um, we'll do better and we can still keep your chemotherapy mm -hmm. at the doses that will be most effective. Right. So I think that's really a, a very interesting way. Let's talk about how we monitor patients for a minute uh, in terms of what's happening during that period of risk in that first week. So Eric, can you talk about some tools that we have to, to utilize and, and to get some uh, information from the patients? Yeah, so um, I think something that I'm observing in a lot of institutions now is uh, even just the phone call um, 24 to 48 hours after leaving the infusion center and just having a, a nurse um, check in with a patient is, has been exceedingly helpful for a lot of our patients. And then really pushing that to a, the next level, which would be using evidence-based uh, questionnaires to try to quantify what that experience has been. And there's a couple out there. Um, the FLEA is one and the MAT is the other. Uh, the FLEA is the functional uh, living index. Functional for living index for uh, emesis. We like the term FLEA. So FLEA is a lot easier. <laughs> and MAT is the um, Multinational Association of Supportive Care and Cancer anti emesis tool. Um, and it's important to recognize when to use each one. So uh, both cover nausea and vomiting and uh, the acute and delayed phases. But the flea has been validated in the three and five day recall period, whereas the mat um, is really 
excellent for the 24 hour recall. So I try not to double up on them. And if you're gonna make one phone call, say at three days, the flea would be your choice. But if you're gonna be uh, checking in with patients over a 24 hour period, you would choose the mat. It's a, and your point about having a nurse or a nurse navigator, which increasingly we're all using and they're wonderful to get some feedback and to be proactive is, is really good. Because it's hard for patients. Sometimes it tur turns out on Friday afternoon they decide that they're calling with their nausea and vomiting and then it's the weekend and sometimes they get admitted. Yep. And all of that can be prevented to a large extent if they call early and get appropriate supportive care. Yep. So these tools are great and validated and they seem pretty easy to use, but I'll be honest, I don't feel like uh, people are using them and certainly not using them proactively. Like, are you guys getting the same experience? I agree. We're not, we haven't formalized that we've used these tools outside of a research setting. Right. Mm -hmm. so. yes, yeah, we haven't successfully really used them. I think more from a time savings perspective. Um, one thing to do advocate for patients to do though is to keep a diary or a calendar somehow of how sick you were after your chemo. Most of my chemotherapy regimens are every three weeks. So when they come back three weeks later, they say, oh, I don't think it was that bad. And usually their caregiver says, it was terrible. What are you talking <laughs> about? So, you know, writing down how you felt in that first week, because then three weeks later, you can go back and see what you wrote, um, as opposed to not remembering later. Or that minimizing thing that Howard talked about. So. Yeah, well, I, I, I agree because we do that with all of our chemotherapies that people go out on, especially the orals. We're saying just write down a word on the calendar just to remind you because when you ask them how they're doing, that was the last three days. Right. And three weeks right. ago or two weeks ago, they don't remember that for four days they were miserable. They're feeling great, right. you know, and you have to really remind them. And we look at it and we go, oh, yeah, but you said this. Oh, that's right. We can help you with that.